Ah, I'm really happy to see you. I'm really happy to be here. Yes, the, the title of this is Coming to See You Since I Was Five Years Old, An American Poet's Connection to the South African Soul. I have, and I wrote this this morning, so, <laughs> so it's fresh. <laughs> I have spent <clears throat> most of the early morning from three o'clock Thinking of what I want to say to you, there is so much. First of all, I want to say that I am in your country, have been drawn to your country, the beautiful South Africa, which for some years in our own struggle, we referred to as Azania, because of a deep love of you, of your heroines and heroes, of your long, long struggle toward positive humanity for yourselves and for all oppressed people on the planet. You have been a great inspiration to all people on earth who are interested in and devoted to justice, peace, and happiness. I was asked to provide a title for my talk, and this is what came to me, coming to see you since I was five years old, a poet's connection to the South African soul. The reason I have been coming your way for over 60 years is because when I was five years old, my eldest sister, Mamie Lee Walker, um, came home from college her freshman year and taught my 11-year-old sister and myself your national anthem. Inko si selele Africa. We were the only children of any color who were taught this song in our tiny, totally segregated town in the deep south of the United States in Georgia. The somber, intense passion and dignity of the melody entered my heart. It has lodged there for the last 60 years. It did not just lodge there. It propelled me into the deepest of curiosities about who Africans might truly be. Because in the deeply racist United States of the 40s and 50s, when I was born, Africa was shrouded in the most profound mists of distortion, racially motivated misperceptions, gross exploitation, and lies. Africans were almost cheerfully despised, considered to be savages, certainly. And yet for me and for my sister Ruth, there was our sister Mamie coming home from college whose fees my materially poor parents sweated to pay. There was the sound of in Kusiselele Africa. God bless Mother Africa was sung so earnestly by her loving sons and daughters, her horribly abused children, that it made an impression on our psyches, never to be erased. Here is part of the poem that goes with this awakening to Africa. In the poem, I changed my sister Mamie's name to Molly. For my sister Molly, who in the 50s knew Hamlet well, and read into the night, and coached me in my songs of Africa, a continent I never knew but learned to love because they, she said, could carry a tune and spoke in accents never heard in Etonton. When I myself went off to college, it was that song, in Africa, that sound of so much humility, love, devotion, and trust that led me to the most important friendship I encountered during my student years. My friendship with an African woman named Constance Nabwiri, who hailed from Uganda. From that friendship and the understanding that Constance and I were sisters, developed my deep interest in and concern for Africa 
and its peoples, its animals, its rainforests, and its diverse cultures. Through the writing of Africans, both male and female, I began to encounter an intellectual and moral thoughtfulness that bordered on and often embodied the most astonishing profundity. I remember reading The Radiance of the King, for instance, and just being stunned. It should not have been surprising that as soon as I found a way to do so, while I was still 19 or 20, I made my way to East Africa, to the land of Constance Nabwiri's birth, to discover for myself what made her such a wonderful person, wise and gentle beyond her years, and certainly beyond that of most of the other girls at our school. I am happy to say I encountered a Uganda that bears little resist, re resemblance to the one we see today. Uganda was once referred to as the Asian part of Africa because of the people's gentle courtesy and kindness. It was also a land of the greenest valleys and hills where there was a palpable feeling of peace and patience with the stranger. I was taken in immediately by a Ugandan family who sheltered and cared for me during my visit dispelling forever any sense I might have had that I would not be recognized as one of Africa's children. From this encounter in Africa, and later in Kenya, where I joined others in beginning the construction of a school, I followed my curiosity about the African continent in many of my works. It was in Kenya that I first learned of female genital cutting. I was so shocked that I hid from this subject for many years. <clears throat> and then, because by now I knew I loved Africa, whatever was happening, I set out to learn all that I could about this practice, and then I set out to write about it as fully as I could. This I did in a novel called Possessing the Secret of Joy. I was driven to find the answer to the question, why would any parent who loved them willingly hurt their children? One of the things I began to understand about oppression as I worked on this issue was how the oppressor, whoever it is, will happily steal everything we have, but they will leave us our self-inflicted suffering. They will leave us, gladly leave us, our scars. And they will then help others define us by the wounds and scars we give ourselves. They will take all our land, our water, our minerals, and our dances even, and they will feel justified in doing so. But they will leave us with visibly very little, except that which is gruesome to outsiders and painful to those of us who must suffer it. The resonance of Inkosiselele Africa is also deeply, deeply embedded in the color purple. Half of that novel is set in Africa, in colonial Africa among Africans and explores what happens to the Africans as their land is confis confiscated by foreign rubber plantation owner thieves. The discovery that Africans are enslaved on their own land is of grave concern to the African-American missionaries who come to understand that they too, in America, have been stolen from the African people and the African continent in the same way that the land has been. This is a horrifying realization and sends them into intense pain and grief. They are also awakened to the sham, they are also awakened to the sham of their missionary mission to quote, uplift the hapless natives. Many readers fail to realize this, but the color purple is a theological text. It is about the reclamation of one's original God, the earth and nature. 
It is about re-examining that word that most colonized people are taught to loathe, pagan. One who loves and, worship who loves and worships nature, venerates and protects Mother Earth. One who cares for all of her creatures with a degree of acceptance and tolerance. There is a built-in humility toward nature that means it is respected for the very wonder of its being, and that if a tree must be cut down, for instance, one must beg its pardon. This respect for nature <clears throat> is one of the biggest losses to Africans and other indigenous peoples since our domination and colonization by people who think about nature entirely differently than we do or than we used to. Those unfortunate sufferers in the northern part of the globe who suffered from the ravages and hardships so severely of the last ice age. Africa. God bless Africa. Hearing this song, learning this song, hearing your heart and soul coming through it, even as a five-year-old, how could I ever leave you? And so I have taken you, your spirit, the spirit of Steve Biko, of Winnie Mandela, of Nelson Mandela, of the children of Sharpville, completely into the very marrow of my bones. In our own struggles to end American apartheid, you have been with us. In our struggles against nuclear wars, I mean nuclear wars and weapons that threaten to end all of our lives, your struggle has encouraged us. In the infinitely long struggle to affirm the rights of women, your example of never giving up sustains us. For we have seen in your struggle the completely complementary nature of male and female solidarity in the pursuit of the common objective freedom. In my ongoing befriending of the other animals of the planet, it is your struggle that is part of my passionate defense of them. For who knows better than black South Africans and those who stood with them what it has meant to be treated as if one did not deserve to live. Another poem from my very first visit to East Africa, when I didn't understand that just as the white man wantonly slaughtered the buffalo in my country, he was busily destroying the animals of Africa. I saw this in a shop window in Nairobi, but naive as I was, I did not understand what I was seeing. It is a short poem. If you blink, you could miss it. Only this, a haiku. Elephant legs in a store to hold umbrellas. <laughs> <laughs> 